So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm nervous too. I'm so um, I, I, I'm so honored to be a to be a part of this group since 2012, and to get the chance to travel and share ideas and have you know feel like a, a part, just one interlocutor in a larger conversation, trying to understand uh, something that we don't often get the chance to do. It seems like it's it's it, it's often very guarded. So. My interest and, and my respect and my thanks to the Port Journeys Network uh, really stems from um, a feeling of gratitude regarding growing up in the middle of North America, living on its coasts, and feeling like my worldview was very much mediated by uh, relationship, corporate relationships and globalization that drove themselves into me, that branded my understanding of many things and require uh, subcult subcultures as spaces of refuge and a, a whole lot of unwinding. And, and I think that what this provides us beyond all of the great artworks, maybe what this pro pro what this what this provides us is the opportunity to level the playing field for how we experience globalization um, as winners and losers, but as individuals that start to recreate the stories or the, the connective tissue amongst all of us and not have that uh, predetermined. So that, that's very much my interest in this. And this is a continued conversation. Today I kind of want to talk about um, what I'm terming wonder over knowing instead of doubt, uh, you know, doubt versus certainty and violence, but in a, in a very similar way probably much less articulate than Ivy. Um, but how it makes me, I don't know how I feel, but I know I'm feeling something. And how, it, how, how those things uh, affect, uh, I think, shared levels of stress when we meet each other and we start to talk and gauge where we are, how we think about these subjects. So um, this book was brought by this man. Uh, to Guangzhou and presented as a starting point. And so I put together some other readings that I sourced that I thought would add to this conversation of what the hypercultural might be or where we might start from your presentation in Guangzhou. So bear with me if, you, if this feels abrupt, like an abrupt jump into a point of conversation um, that had been ongoing through the, you know, the, the trials and, and the uh, winnings and the, the shared successes of the initial Port Journeys projects and talks. So I'm going to go through, these are a little complicated, I wouldn't try to read them. I'm going to go through essentially what I think of as, I've constructed four knots to talk about. So they're hair balls in a way, or they're things that are twisted together. I don't think they go top to bottom as much, or they don't provide us organization as much as they start to case a system of relationships. And, and so what I'm terming the hypercultural mountain, um, and the difficulty of limited exchanges versus what I think is occurring in the economic paradigm world experience, experiencing with um, like whole winning or disruptive innovation and, and inequality in tension with that. Um, and then the societal effects of lack of participation or the difficulty in participation works and how that relates to levels of comfort. And then also, um, this tricky, very tricky thing, and I'm going to be really nervous about the way Heidi looks at me when I talk about it. <laughs> There's this really tricky idea about individual volition or will. Individual will um, as a form of courage. And I don't want that will to be a form of knowing or certainty or potential violence, but, but a sense of courage um, to mark or to understand line or to drift. So as to say, so the, the hypercultural hyper mountain, as I've termed it for this talk, is this immense feeling of us all kind of standing on our heads. You know, um, we're each left, I think, with the media interface or social media to understand everything all at once in, in a certain way. And so I think this involves um, social and visual perception, how we know what images actually mean or visual literacy versus the distance between those spaces or what I term in my teaching as spatial literacy, the, the mapping or organization of where these relationships come from, much like the tour we took yesterday of organizational space. And then 
on the side of this, I feel like there are, there's this, you know, the, the initial pressures of globalization from corporations versus what it is to be an individual or how the individual might have to convert itself back in to a mini corporation or be an entrepreneur of itself, so to say, and behave the same way. Now, the blurring is, is it produces um, whew, all these different feelings, right, of, of doubt uh, and, and spaces to drift or wonder because this blurring on the one hand, corporations have abstract rights and they can get rid of themselves and they can start something new. Individuals have these really problematic identities they construct and it's super hard to get rid of those, especially when you become part of a group or, um, you know, do, it's just really hard to, you know, recover from identity bankruptcy over and over again, which we're kind of asked to do in this paradigm. And so the conflict between, I think, uh, the state of introspection or thinking about thinking is something that I'm really interested in, especially in the context of social media or uh, a device-heavy environment where we know, or we don't know, we, I feel or I see uh, loss, or conceptions of, of loss in terms of intimacy and democracy under transparency and surveillance and us watching each other and uh, it becoming you know, a 24-7 environment of managing social relationships. So I feel there's something that, that, that the, if, there, if this is a cup to fill, um, doubt, and, doubt and cultural regression are not to be understood as the same thing, but limited exchanges are, are uh, I think, an effect of both of those things on the one hand, the courage to doubt or to drift or to daydream or to be or to make marks uh, versus the cultural regression to, you know, to, you know, to produce less or hide or spend more time surveilling <coughs> than thinking about thinking or in a state of introspection. So I want to share some works. Mostly they're, they're, everything is either uh, individual artwork or a collaborative artwork. Ultimately, from my practice, I'm... Um, an I'm an artist that's an architecture professor teaching the fifth year, the, the uh, individual research project year, so it affords me a great deal of opportunity to think about, you know, the responsibility of working with young people that are making choices to set up ways that they might work or ways to stay open. Um, and I think of that as a, as, as a form of, of helping to construct a form of scene. And I like this, this project we did for a children's museum a long time ago, where it's essentially a camera obscura that inverts the image that a uh, child or a teen gets inside of, and then they can cart around or move around and, and, and look at the projection on the screen. But the, the, the nauseating or, or the, uh, the courage it takes to continue on in an inverted relationship or image that you can't quite see or can't quite control is the space of wonder that I'm in now. This might be a fairly aggressive form of wonder, but I have, through other people and mentors, become to feel really comfortable about this. I'm gonna be 41 soon, and I know that's not that old, but I finally have just kind of admitted, maybe I admitted it a long time ago, but I feel it now that I'm, I'm more at ease in a state of constant confusion. I, I, I know that I'm going to be confused, and the more I accept that, the more I can kind of, uh, you know, it, it helps me almost personally navigate my day and, and not be upset by the way things go or something like that. So this is a kind of a work of confusion um, or a way of seeing I like to think about with young folks or the time is going. So the next component of the knot that I wanted to discuss was you know, the skills gap that we experience, right? I mean, you see this in this city. There are, there are two cities building themselves. There's the one for, in North America, this big conversation about the 99% versus the 1%. But it is really a skills bias and a tech gap between a certain type of jobs or banking structures want to go into things that are 1 to 20, 1 to 100, 1 to the whole world. Um, and they're really the reconstruction of natural monopolies. We're not having conversations about public utilities and thinking of these things as shared, like is the internet the mail? You know, I mean, what, at what point do we start to think of Google and Facebook and these things that are so large, like global natural monopolies are not necessarily being discussed. And this is really difficult because we, you know, with 
the, my students, we, we, we almost feel like it's a risk and our institutions aren't even betting on public art education or you know, we don't have a ministry of culture in the United States, it's all privatized. But we know that fewer and fewer schemes are becoming available for these, venture, these banks and venture capitalist situations to get it all at once. And we know that the investor class is narrowing a little more and more and more. And so the question is very much what to be. And for our friend that is not here, who we all love and are interested in so much, I pose this question in this diagram to Patrick. Um, many of you might not know this guy. He's an artist friend of ours. It's real fun. And he got so, he understood what I, the tension of what I was going for so strong that he slammed his hand on the desk and he said, the right answer is Spaceman. You know, like, that the, 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 it's not uh, what the guidance counselor, or what the professor, or what everybody is giving you available or your silent degree, that it is something that you might not be able to understand. Um, and I, so I don't know how this erosion is occurring or this entropy, but I think Heidi uh, has a lot of insights. For me, there's this sort of umbrella about personhood and how that relates to geography and property and um, how that might be informed by place or informed by objects or these problematic relationships we have with systems of objects, ourselves um, being subjects. And then this, this bottom thing that I'm, um, the Stress and Freedom book by Schlotterdijk that I'm really interested in, I kind of know all the issues with him. But how we gauge this as a group um, very much helps us, you know, maybe this is mediated by larger media, structure, media structures and things like this, but that's what we've been doing over the past few days. We've been walking around with brilliant people asking them how they feel about things that we share, and we're all looking through this window of globalization that we don't necessarily control. And we're, for me, it's very much about gauging stress levels or something. And are these stress levels induced? Are they supported? Or are conceptions um, built and shared by the way that we all respond to each other? And I know that the, 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 the big one, that in, and I don't know if it's pushing from the bottom, but it, really the phrase of our time in the United States right now is this idea of inequality and how these Disruptive, innovative spaces just expect the infrastructure to exist for inequality, even though the infrastructure relationships are shared. And I think that that's a difficult thing. So I have some works, early works from, uh, this was a, an application developed with Kel Greco where we couldn't stand the idea that Google Maps were almost like the early days of TerraServer and Microsoft and you pay your little bit of money and you zoom in and see the golf ball from the satellite and it felt a little different than when it all became, the, the mapping of the whole globe became owned by a single entity and we wanted to know how can you disrupt that or how can, can you write something that can erode that um, structure or imposed control. So we were fidgeting with things like that. That led to a, a other t work or talk uh, that I was up to regarding the subdivision of space based on use or based on development uh, across urban geographies. And, and we see that now where we want to understand um, this, this city less as a series of easy titles to make and uh, tax revenue per city investment things and more based on, I don't know, doubt, individual volition, um, casual relationships, daily life, everyday exchanges, uh, and things like that. So for the new cities, or the new infill, this becomes a large question. But I think what, in, in my work, in, in my sculptural practice, what this amounts to is I've identified this space of thinking in terms of connective tissues versus thinking in terms of indexical relationships. Connective tissues are difficult. You know, especially if you're socially awkward like me and you're not really charismatic. It's, you're sharing but you're doubting yourself or you're, you know, how do you get to be involved in other people's lives? I found, you know, through uh, outreach and community service works and making myself available and teaching that I can very much uh, work in a connective tissue framework, um, which is, I think, littered with the imagery and, um, the products, the services, the things that we can offer each other uh, that we need to survive in an economy versus the emotional support and the care and the kinship and the friendship and the humanity that we can provide each other um, in, in, in such a vi vivid way. 
uh, and how, do you, how those things can all be seen as integrated maybe into our lives or the way we support our lives. This is difficult, especially for those, I think for everybody, back to the selfhood or, or an understanding of, um, we've been in Berlin for a few days and I'm kind of encouraged by the hanging around. Where, back where we are, I feel like there, there, there's, it's in, in San Diego specifically, in a, in a very expensive city, what we can even call a toy city, it almost seems like there's a single class emerging in you know, Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego, New York, some of the other, the other spaces where the, the cynicism from everybody else is what they expected that they should have had or, or what, what they you know, would, what would have occurred in this generation, which is very troubling to see amongst young people because I feel like that is getting back to that lack of participation or the, you know, um, uh, almost like a meaninglessness if I didn't arrive or get what I was supposed to be, you know. Um, everybody, we constructed everybody to be David Bowie and this is just not an easy thing to do. And, and I think that it was built for us, right? So this sculpture deals with plan development or what you get as a unit and how that might relate to your personhood or property. These things all lead into my mind uh, lack of participation and, and fallout from uh, maybe one dimensionality or loss of belief. Um, I really, really, I was in a conversation with Sandra yesterday talking about um, Senate to some extent, but I'm really interested with belief in terms of having to gain a proficiency that you, belief can be so problematic, but in order to gain a proficiency or a skill, you have to believe that you're practicing. In to practice, you have to believe that it, what you're doing is right, even if it's wrong, it'll give you the time or the duration to get good um, as a musician, as a, you know, in, in, in so many things in life. So we've had a quick conversation about what Han descri describes in the Burnout Society as Discipline Society, at odds with Achievement Society, Discipline Society being uh, one where you're given a place at the end of your life, one where you're given a role or a way to live, and this produces all of these issues with uh, repressed feelings and psychoanalysis kind of works to help drum up those things, but then the cat gets out of the bag in the cultural liberation, 60s, things like that, and we enter achievement society in a space that you can be anything you want, but now this is really difficult because, you know, uh, you, you know, you will try and try and try, stand on your head, and be, instead of being repressed, you, as Han talks about it, this produces a society of depresses, depressives and losers, and I think Hillbilly Eulogy is an interesting book that starts to describe what's happening in North America with our, um, oxy, uh, you know, our, our heroin epidemic, roughly, and, uh, you know, a, a, a fatigue, a fatigue from seeing yourself and trying all the time. And I've talked about this as meaninglessness or flat, and I think this leads into, um, you know, kind of the presidential election, right, which is like, um, when everything is seen at once, it's almost pornographic or the total exposure of everything being equal renders everything else into this kind of dead space. I mean, I don't know how much, how much we can get moved. There's like a limit to the movement on our phones. And so like, I think the flatness is like 2D1, or t 2D temporarily has taken over, and it's taken over our time. And I think of this as, they're just saying, like there, maybe there are limits to effect. You know, like you could, be in this room right now, I could stand up, um, burden, or I could, you know, I could shoot myself, and that could be the scariest thing that could happen, or the, the the loud noise went off last night, or you know. But what is the height or the loss in relation to your body that you can experience? And what is that when it's being mediated by a phone, or you're experiencing searching for everybody, you hear about something good, and you see it then? Um, reality television, national politics—they've kind of crossed into this space where they're equally as believable, uh, and, 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 and so the media's role to how we feel comfortable with that uh, is something I'm interested in, and I don't know a way to explain that or to build language for that, but I, I, I put this note in here, perception of psycho body and viral damage, like how much damage can you put on a body, how much damage can you put on a narrative, how much damage, you know, 
the effects of this violence that has been so organized and predetermined for us that I think Heidi is helping us build the, maybe the will or the courage to doubt. Um, so these are some, some, some drawings dealing with the pornographic or the absurd in architecture or detail elements uh, from my work. Um, these are you know, some more of this idea about the indexing of space or the indexing of relationships that's provided to us. It doesn't matter if it's pancakes spelled wrong or Saudi Arabia or tan lines. All of these things happen all at once on the interface and can show up in such a stream. And how we negotiate those certain, you know, the, the I guess the absurdity of the index, indexical relationships that are provided to us are something that, in, that in, um, interests me very much. This gets back to where I think we have tried to work in the past with the Periscope Project, exploring engagements, poor journeys on um, city building uh, that we're doing now, is that there's very few alternative development models in education, in the city, uh, in, the, in, in, in ways to work humanely, and power retention and private in interest is this big mass that always seems to haunt or be the cigarette of that that, of that structure. The idea of the periscope is that there's something we can share amongst each other. Um, you know, and I don't know that, it, for the comment of Barbara, that, it, that, that, that we can always look to a mayor, or a mayor wouldn't be influenced by the edge city in such a way, but this is something that I think is comprised of individuals or communities. I do believe in the roving residencies, student experiments and collaborations and civic engagement, uh, projects addressing public issues, uh, you know, uh, in such a way. So this is a quick overview of the Periscope project that um, many of you are familiar with, which was an artist-run space for five years that shifted into a roving group of collaborators working with institutions and museums, occupying a vacant lot initially in a hyper-developing uh, scenario in downtown San Diego and working to create after-school or parallel academic uh, programs, so in between high school and college or that gray area where people don't know what they need to do. Um, we wanted to provide a space to think about the world with, instead of letting these people be instantly trapped into long-term student loan debt or decisions, you know, borrowing money to drift, essentially, um, because all, all of, I don't, we don't, I mean, other than, I think every university without a merit-based scholarship has cost a great deal of money in the United States. So this was kind of, it's trying to be that in-between space, or, or uh, to exist and think about maybe life and the city and, and what would happen. So a series of, of, of programs always based on issues in the city, working to imagine who the city was for versus what uh, you know directions might be taken by young people. And ultimately, in the end, you see this big tower on the right. That is what that environment is now. They're building. 45 story to one, maxing out the floor area ratios of all these lots in San Diego. It's the fourth most heavily international hedge fund real estate invested environment in the world. Um, so it's, it's growing rapidly. Exploring engagement, we shifted into public performance works with a large grant from the James, James Irvine Foundation working through the Oceanside Museum of Art. This is the program which we were able to round out artists in the port around uh, UE Inoue and the Four Journeys Network and collaborate with our dear friend uh, um, and artist friend uh, Tim Schwartz, colleague, and, and work with a, a program he runs called Status, which is a mobile residency program in, in an old Airstream trailer that interfaces with the geography and, uh, and kind of pop up public participation works with folks like this. He's kind of like an on demand guy. So you can. You can it's kind of going to get after him. So these are some photos from the local artists that were built around uh, Yui's project. And then really amazing thing about Story of the Clouds was that something truly does happen, just like Hypercultural Tapas last night, when we are making something together that we experience. I mean, we are social beings. Teamwork is not, uh, or I don't know, maybe I can help with this too. I'm still so nervous. Uh, you know, it, it feel, I feel good when I work on a team, I establish shared values of care, and then something amounts to it, and then we experience it. I don't know if I'm, I'm bad on time. Five, okay, perfect. So then this moved into the, the drone project. We, we found it years ago on Craigslist. I found a, a MQ-1 Predator drone that was shipped to Afghanistan, and the container was left. And so we took 
one of the huge things about San Diego's killer is the idea that we are essentially the war machine, the telecommunications industry, and this is $300 detritus with an $18,000 price tag on the side of it, which is so hard to stomach. So we took this around sites of recreation and began to do public participation work, talking to folks, essentially inviting them into this exhibition about the California lifestyle at the expense of what is exported in the global, global everything terror. So for myself, I, I mean, I, I teach drawing, um, and, and, and I think about the line and the mark a lot. Uh, in terms of individual um, volition or a feeling of nativeness or feeling of movement that's, that relates to time and nature that's connective versus being mediated by indexical relationships. I've started to think a little more in my own practice about, about the, the productivity of creative mania, of just wanting to move, of it being okay to move, um, and, getting, and, and getting away with it. You know, I would love to say at 70 years old I got away with it to a young person. Maybe that young person would say, what do you mean? I'd say, I got to practice four hours a day. Music, drawing, reading. You know, I, got, I, I was able to, you know, I wasn't totally afraid of poverty, and I was able to kind of be at the pace of nature or, or, or settled with, with, with my nature and, and help. I don't know. That's some, something I, I like to think of. Um, uh, I think Schlotterdijk calls this the use of uselessness, or Han talks about rest uh, versus restlessness. Um, and I, this is a huge thing. As, as a professor, you, you imagine how you work as an individual or maybe as a drawer and what you're helping people discover in drawing, the time of drawing versus the institutional performance of you leading them or being responsible for the future debt. Or so those are things I think about helping people um, in being and expression. I, I don't think I can get rid of the self so fast. I like David Jocelyn's. Um, he talks about this as private practice, public concern for the early abstract expressionists. So I think of, you know, maybe if drawing is a private matter, or studio practice is a private matter, civic concerns and everything that, that is occupying my mind is happening during that, uh, what I call self-inflicted unemployment, which is practice. Like when you're practicing and you're not performing, you're choosing to be unemployed. You're taking yourself out of, uh, you know, a billable rate or something like this. And I think there's a courage to that. So there's a courage to this space of doubting or living in a confused way that I'm so, um, hopefully this, maybe this is a way to think about that from my end. Um, and I don't know if that's a responsibility to act from being afraid of doubting. Like doubting sounds like, so, you know, the unknown is always a space. So these are some drawings that have resulted from a process like that dealing with line and dealing with conceptions of history for the Dream Dra Green Dragon Colony, specifically in La Jolla. And these are some larger pattern works that I've been up to as well um, that I like to frame as the impact on decision making, right? I like to think that the drawing is not that important, but the time spent doing the drawing very much impacts what decisions I am able to make uh, thereafter, oops, thereafter. And so these are a little more closer underst understanding of how I'm positing these as property, you know, or time, or personhood, or something like that. So there, there, there's this legal description of decor that I'm interested in. Um, and you can see the scale of the drawings on the right. So this piece is roughly 10 feet by 5 feet, or something like that. And it's not, you know, if it's stylized by however I've been educated, it's more than anything um, just a result of being able to spend the time. And I'm not so interested in, in, in it as an object of desire or beauty, but a space of wonder. And that's what I'm advocating for essentially in this talk is the courage to wonder over to know. I'm more comfortable wondering than, than knowing. Um, this is a new project we're up to all end with. Uh, starting three and a half years, we've been developing a city neighborhood space that is just now starting to be constructed and programmed in the center of the country near Indianapolis, Chicago, St. Louis, Cleveland, all, and we're interested in the, these relationships from the expensive cities to the cities that are coming back online. So maybe these are, are many um, places to drift without the pressures of the large 
larger economy. Yeah. So, and not to take ourselves so seriously. You know, so I guess. <laughs> don't take anything I'm saying too seriously. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.